Good afternoon, one and all. Let me make sure my sound is going in. I believe it is. We're literally on the dot of 5.45. Thank you for joining me. In fact, us, because I'm James, I'm here, I'm broadcasting. Obviously, it's Thursday. What's the date today? 5th of May. Man City lost last night. Wow, what a game. Anyway, we've also got Marta, who's, on, uh, who's doing the comments chat for us this afternoon. If you want to post a comment or a question, we really urge you to do so. We really value it, actually. You can do that on the hub page. There's a live chat dedicated to these revision shows. You can go and chat there. Come straight to us. Marta will pick it up and bring it to me and we'll try and answer it on screen or she will try and answer it on there. If you want to post a comment to us on Twitter or on one of our social feeds, you can do that there. We have disabled the live chat on YouTube. Those of you that go to YouTube live sessions probably know why we've done that uh, in this kind of educational building, kind of growth type experience. Anyway, we are going to cover Applied Anatomy and, <laughs> applied anatomy and Physiology for AQA A-Level P this afternoon and specifically we're going to cover the material on the AEI. Your kind of revision checklist for this afternoon really is you should have your notes pages, you should have your practice questions properly attempted, you should have hopefully access to the mark schemes and the model answers. If you've got that around you right now, you are ready to go and you're in great shape. And we're going to go through what I would estimate to be around about an hour session this evening and we're going to really get you guys up to speed, I hope. Now, a couple of things I'm going to ask of you. First of all, we do not want anything from you in terms of money, payment, anything like that. You you guys, especially students, it's been, it's been a tough couple of years. The year 11 thing, tough in year 12, come to year 13, we've got big exams to face, right? That's why we're putting this out for free because we think you deserve that support. What you can do to, to support is, you probably know what's going to come here, go subscribe to the channel, smash the hell out of that like button. It genuinely helps us. We've got a dream. We have a dream of 7,500 subscribers. So if you want us to get there, that would be a really lovely thing. And it just promotes our channel on YouTube and it's lovely for that we do that. All our stuff's on there is free. So why not do that? Also to you teachers out there, if you're interested in our wider work, and again, I'm not plugging anything here, if you're interested in our wider work and you'd like to get these A-level kids on there if they're not using it at the moment, we offer a 28-day free, free trial. You can have that for the next month. Get these students ready for the exams using some other resources. You don't have to pay a penny. It's got the exam similar on there. It's got the courses on there. It's ready to go. Um, finally, um, I wanted to mention here uh, about what's going to happen next week. So obviously next week, uh, let me get this right, on Monday we've got skill acquisition, on Tuesday we've got sport and society. The notes, uh, the, the model answers, the mark schemes for those will go live tomorrow on Friday. Uh, that'll be Friday the 6th and you'll be able to print those off before the weekend uh, should you want to. Those will go onto the hub pages. Uh, I did want to suggest say one thing though about the sport and society. I was planning that this afternoon, putting the canvases together and actually to really it's a really narrow session. So we think that's only going to be about 35, 40 minutes. So if you're planning that one, just bear in mind, we think that's going to be the time. We don't know exactly because it's live, obviously, but there are thereabouts. Now, with that in mind, I'm going to get straight on with this. Let's see if we can switch feeds successfully. This is always the nerve wracking bit for me because it's the bit that could go wrong. But hopefully this is going to work. Don't forget, ask comments and questions if you have them. Here we go.
So let's see if we can give this a go. We're going to start off with our anaerobic systems. Obviously, we've got our short duration, high intensity systems up there. So of course, we're talking about anaerobic systems. So we're going to talk about phosphocreatine and the lactic acid or glycolytic system. So I want to start with the base principle. And that base principle is the breakdown of ATP, which of course is going to lead us to uh, a necessity and awareness of our own system. So what we've got here is existing in all cells. We have ATP, which of course you biologists will know we use for many, many processes. Uh, ATP is broken down into eight, in the presence of ATPase, which is the controlling enzyme of this particular reaction, into adenosine diphosphate, and it releases an inorganic phosphate, and it releases energy. Now, it's this energy that's going to be transferred to some kind of kinetic energy store. In other words, we're going to use it for movement, okay? So I'm not going to get into energy stores here, but that energy is going to be used. Effectively, it's going to be transferred. It's going to become movement, right? So that's what that is. So in essence, folks, what we're left with is we've got this ADP, which can no longer be utilized. So we have energy systems to effectively get ADP and return it into an ATP state. So let's have a look at the first one. We have phosphocreatine. This is present in the sarcoplasm of the muscle. Okay, uh, you biologists, you can say cytosol or, or cytoplasm if you prefer. So the PC, phosphocreatine, which has got a limited store in the sarcoplasm, is going to be broken down in the presence of the controlling enzyme creatine kinase, and it's going to release a phosphagen, it's going to leave over creatine, and it's going to release energy. Now this energy is not donated to movement. Rather, what we find here is that we take our ADP from here, we take our phosphagen from here, we take our energy from here, and effectively what we can do is we can now build ADP plus phosphagen plus the energy, which of course is now being used is now being uh, taken into the reaction. So this is going to be um, this is going to be uh, endothermic, and we get the resynthesis of ATP, which ultimately brings us back to the start point, which lo and behold we have once again down the bottom here. So the point I'm trying to make here is that we have what we would describe as a coupled reaction. Okay, we have a coupled reaction. We have the product of one reaction uh, being used subsequently in another reaction. So we have the uh, phosphagen, ADP, and although energy is not a product, they're then used in a subsequent reaction. Any, any uh, reaction where energy is released is, of course, exothermic. And any uh, time where it's taken in, this is endothermic. Okay, and together they make a coupled reaction. The products of one reaction are used uh, subsequently in another reaction. So it's in this way we can resynthesize ATP, which is the only utilizable store of energy for movement and the only one that can be transferred. So a couple of things that I'd really, really like to emphasize about this system, okay? And I haven't left myself much space, so I'll sort of squeeze it in here. So first of all, we've got an energy yield of one to one. Okay, what do we mean by that? Well, we mean by that, that for one phosphocreatine, we get one ATP. We've got an energy yield of one. We have no byproducts. Now, those eagle-eyed amongst you will probably have realized that if you look across this image, we have got something left over. We've actually got left over one C and one inorganic phosphate. And you might want to imagine what might happen when we start delivering oxygen to this muscle, to those things. Well, not surprisingly, they are restructured into phosphocreatine. Nevertheless, we've got no byproducts, no fatigue in byproducts. Furthermore, this is happening, as I've said already, in the sarcoplasm or the cytoplasm or the cytosol, if you want to use that term, biologists. This releases very high intensity energy. Okay? It's very high intensity energy. So we can use this for a javelin throw, for a sprint, etc., etc. But it lasts only eight to 10 seconds. Now, think back to your energy continuum graphs as an example. Um, this is eight to 10 seconds in duration. So, of course, this is a weakness of the system, whereas this is a strength of the <laughs> to be green. Whereas this is a strength of the system. Okay, this is a strength, whereas this is a weakness of our system. So we've got this kind of capacity to resynthesize this ATP through that system, but it will only last for eight to ten seconds of very high intensity energy. The other thing we might want to say about this system is there's no delay for O2 delivery. And what I mean by that is that, of course, all of the reactants for the reaction are in the cell already. So it can it can go, it can, it can release energy immediately or can resynthesize ATP immediately. Okay, let's do a question on that one before we move forward. The shot put 
is one of the most explosive events in athletics. We agree. Describe the predominant energy system which resynthesizes ATP during this event. So we're describing here, folks. We need to give the characteristics. So what do we have? We know it's the ATP PC system because, of course, it's uh, it's a sh very short duration. We've got the breakdown of phosphocreatine in the presence of creatine kinase. By the way, I should have put that creatine kinase is the controlling enzyme. Creatine kinase is the controlling enzyme. I, should have, I, I mentioned it, but let me clarify. It occurs in the sarcoplasm. The reaction is anaerobic, and we get an energy yield of one to one. What did we what didn't we uh, include there? It's used to resynthesize ATP. I, I'm not. I, I tell you what. That shouldn't be there because it's part of the question. I'm not happy with that mark scheme. That shouldn't be in there because it's effectively named in the question. So we won't we won't credit that one any further. So there's our A lactacid or our ATP PC system. Now let's turn our attention to the lactic acid or what we can call it. Let me name it here. Our anaerobic our anaerobic glycolytic system. Our anaerobic glycolytic system. So let's have a look at this. Again, we are we are operating here in the sarcoplasm. So let's be super clear about that. We have our fuel source, let me put that term in there. Our fuel source is glycogen. Now remind yourselves, glycogen is stored in the muscle, so it's readily available, but it's also stored a larger store in the liver, so it can be delivered. Um, uh, to to the muscle as well, or the um, yeah. Okay, so we've got glycogen stored in both places. Now we need to convert that into a simple sugar, glucose in essence. So we've obviously got um, glycogen as a as a as a polymer chain here. We need to break it down into a into a sit into a simple sugar. In this case, glucose. Uh, obviously, you biologists know it's a monosaccharide. Um, and in that process, that actually utilizes two ATP. So we've got, an, in terms of this glycolysis, let's put it in here, in terms of this glycolysis, breakdown of glycogen into glucose, we have, we've actually utilized two ATP, so we're two down. But then what we can do is in the presence of PFK, the controlling enzyme, phosphofructokinase, glucose can be broken down to pyruvic acid, and in that process we get the release of four ATP, or we get the re, uh, synthesis of four ATP, which gives us two ATP net, so we know that our energy yield is going to be one to two. Why? Because the net gain is two, and it's taken one glycogen to achieve that. Okay. Now, because we have insufficient oxygen, because of course we're working at high intensity, oxygen can't be delivered as quickly as this, that pyruvic acid in the presence of LDH must be converted into lactic acid. Now, just by way of a descriptor, lactic acid itself also breaks down into hydrogen ion, which is the fatiguing part, and it breaks down into lactate, which is effectively an energy-rich structure which we can utilize, more of which in a few moments' time. But the point I want to make here is that we this hydrogen ion, this is fatiguing. It, de it, it changes blood pH and muscle pH. It denatures enzymes. It actually stops us from being able to release energy um, in the muscle. So therefore, this needs to be removed, more of which in a few moments' time. So, a couple of characteristics of this. So, we've got the fuel source is glycogen. We've got site of reaction is the sarcoplasm. We've got energy yield is one to two. We've got controlling enzyme is PFK. Um, we've got our byproduct, byproduct, which is lactic acid. So, what? How can we sort of describe this for good and for bad? Well, it's immediate because it's available in the cell. It also, we could say no delay for oxygen delivery. We can also say it's high intensity. We could even make an argument that's got a slightly better energy yield than the PC system, although it's not a real strength at this point, because some of the weaknesses of this system we've got are that it's short duration, and specifically it can last up to three minutes, but in reality, three minutes is not typically, it doesn't typically last this long, so that's at not particularly high intensity. Um, the other thing is, of course, it's fatiguing. And what do we mean by that is that the byproduct causes fatigue within that muscle. So it's a very temporary, short duration, fatiguing system, but it can release energy at high intensity and it can do so immediately. And can I just stress to you, this system is gonna last for up to three minutes as the predominant system, I should say, up to three minutes. That's what we're talking about there. And I'll just remind you again that lactic acid this is the negative of this stuff we can use, which I'll come back to in a few moments' time. So there's our lactic acid system. Let's take things on.
Now, we need to talk about obla. Of course, the lactic acid system, by definition, has the impact of releasing lactic acid. So, of course, an accumulation of lactic acid is what we would call obla. And I'd like to introduce you almost to a term you've probably never heard of, which is robla. I don't think you should write that in your exam. But we could even say the rapid onset of blood lactate accumulation, because that's what we find with the point of obla, is that it, it actually occurs really rapidly at the lactate threshold. So a couple of a couple of things to mention here. I would describe this as the point where blood lactate increases rapidly as I just said before rapidly okay rapidly that's what we're talking about we'll, we'll illustrate this uh, graphically in a second and <clears throat> this tends to be around about four millimolecules of blood lactate okay so let's see if we can illustrate this graphically let's have a look here what have we got? So we've got the key thing is on the exercise and the x-axis here. We've got exercise intensity, which is imagine it like a ramp test. It's increasing bit by bit, gradually, one thing at a time. Okay. So what we find here is that lower intensities of exercise. Yes, let, let's focus on our trained athlete, the green first. Yes, we've got the fact that um, blood lactate is increasing, but the point we want to make here is that it doesn't start to increase rapidly sort of more vertical accelerated curve until we hit that four millimolecules okay so at this here this is the point of obla for our trained athlete now if we were talking here about our untrained athlete of course they also hit four millimolecules but they do so much earlier so obla for our untrained athlete is at a lower intensity of exercise in other words they get to four millimolecules and they got a rapid increase late in the trained athlete. Now, if you reflect back on your GCSE biology or if you're studying biology this year, you will know the effect of, lac of lactic acid, or let's just say, let's talk more generally, of acids. So if that lactic acid causes a decrease in blood pH, this has a knock-on effect on the enzymes that are operating. Now, I'm not going to get into kind of lock and key theory, or complement, what's it called, complementary fit theory. What we're going to say here is that the active site of enzymes, they become um, disfigured, or what we call denatured, because of the changing acidic conditions. So in other words, those enzymes can no longer support the reactions that need to happen for the release of energy. So that's why we now get this rapid increase, because our aerobic system can contribute less and less and less and less at those higher intensive exercise because the uh, aerobic enzymes are not operating effectively. Uh, a couple of things I would also like to mention to you is that we've got something called a lactate threshold. Okay, a lactate threshold. And the lactate threshold is thought to be in the region of 2 millimoles of blood lactate. Okay, and what we mean by a lactate threshold is that there's no longer enough oxygen in the system to actually oxidize lactic acid itself. So it leads to increasing anaerobic respiration. So actually here and here, this is what we would call our lactate threshold. And this is really suggesting that we're going to get an increase and then a steep increase at four. Okay, so just make sure that you're aware of that uh, lactate threshold, that lactate threshold term. Okay, let's move things on. Question. Discuss the effectiveness of the anaerobic glycolytic system to resynthesize ATP. So effectively here, folks, we are evaluating. How good is this system? What are its strengths and what are its weaknesses? We're discussing, yes, but we're looking at the positive and the negative. The glycolytic system is effective because it has no delay for oxygen, wonderful. The glycogen stores are already present in the muscle, great, that makes it immediate. Um, this makes the system able to break down glucose quickly, so we're really focusing on that quick, efficient point, and it can get high intensity. Uh, however, it has a byproduct which denatures enzymes, which is lactic acid, and it has a low energy yield. We could also say as a negative here, of course, I'm sure it would have been down here, we could also say short duration. Okay, short duration would also be a completely legitimate point, although it's a longer duration, of course, than the phosphocreatine system. Now, let's take things a little bit further. Yes, we are doing all three energy systems in one big blast, but we've now got energy transfer during long duration low. Oh, by the way, folks, sorry, before I do that, I should have stressed, for our, for our glycolytic system, 
good example. Obviously, we talked about for the PC, the Javelin, the Sprint, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. For our PC system, think about things such as 400 meter race. I really like the the example of a. Let me come down a touch. I really like the example of a full court press in basketball. And if you're not sure what that is, that is when the defending team presses high up the court to win the ball back, usually because the team's behind and they want the ball. So it's very high. You don't get this kind of dropping into the zone and wait, zone waiting for the team to come on to you. No, no, you, you're pressing the ball all the time, so therefore it's more anaerobic in its nature. Uh, you might want to think about things such as 200 metre swim. This sort of thing, these examples are really, really nice for you to emphasise that anaerobic glycolytic system. Okay, let's go on to our aerobic system. Now, you should be pretty familiar with this part of the system here. But it, in fact, is exactly what we've talked about already. But the point we want to make is, yes, we've got a 2 ATP net gain. But what we're going to talk about now is that we now have a situation that we have sufficient oxygen to do this work aerobically. Now, because it's, there's sufficient oxygen there, this must mean a couple of things. It must mean it's longer duration because the oxygen is being delivered. And it must mean it's either low, that's a W, or it's moderate intensity. If it wasn't that, there would not be sufficient oxygen presence. So by definition, that's what we're saying here. So a set, um, sorry, let me find my scroll bar. So pyruvic acid is now processed aerobically and it's, it's converted to citric acid via acetyl coenzyme A. That citric acid is carried into the Krebs cycle. There's two and a quarter turns of that Krebs cycle. You guys in biology will know all about this. And we get the release of the following. We get the resynthesis of 2 ATP. We get CO2 released as a byproduct of this reaction. Of course, that contributes to things like bore shift and the slightly decreased nature of the pH in the blood. But we also get the release of hydrogen ions, okay? Now, these hydrogen ions, they are, they are processable, for want of a better phrase. So how does that go about? So we take these hydrogen ions, with, <laughs> with an R in it, ions, and we take them into the electron transport chain. Now, I should be stressing that this process here is taking place in the mitochondria. Now, again, back to your biology studies, you guys know that mitochondria are an organelle in every cell uh, not quite every cell, actually. They're not in red blood cells, for example. Um, but they're in in vast majority of cells. And in this case, we're talking about muscle cells. And my, and these mitochondria, they are the sites of a, of all aerobic respiration. So ultimately, they're des they're the destination of all oxygen, which is utilised in the body. So we carry this hydrogen, which is ultimately a product of the glycogen, which we've broken down further up. We take it take it down the electron transport chain, and we're able to convert that hydrogen by oxidising it to release water, but also to resynthesize 34 ATP, giving us here 36 net here and two from the top, giving us a potential energy yield of one to 38 for the aerobic system. So I wanna talk quickly about the fuel source of this system. The fuel source is glycogen. I wanna talk about the controlling enzyme. The controlling enzyme, again, is PFK. It operates here. PFK. You can also use uh, glucose phosphorylase, actually. You would also should be given the credit for lipase, although that happens further down the system, because, of course, lipase is used for the breakdown of lipids, of fats. Um, so all of those should be credited as the controlling enzyme. We've got the energy yield of 1 to 38. We've got byproducts that are non-fatiguing, and those byproducts are, of course, CO2 and H2O, they will ultimately be transported to the lung where through exchange will be breathed out. Uh, we, we may well sweat some of the water as well. <clears throat> now, other things we should be stressing here, it happens in the mitochondria. That's what we should be describing. Now, if we do an evaluation now, the strength of this system are its long duration. You could say it's sustainable is a really nice term for you to use. Let's put a plus there. Secondly, we've got no fatigue, uh, <laughs> Mean to do that, but no fatiguing byproducts. And if you want to get real technical about this, you could even say the CO2 is partially helpful for oxygen dissociation and bore shift. And we could also say in here, long duration, no fatiguing byproducts. And we could also say it's efficient. We get one to 38, but there are negatives before we move on. The negatives are that it's low intensity so that's a negative, and we get a delay 
for oxygen delivery. So that's a problem for us. We've got this delay for oxygen delivery. Now, I just want to make just a couple of other points here. Aerobically, we can also process lipids or fats, and that is a process called beta oxidation. And in the presence of lipase, fats can be broken down, and actually they're very, very energy rich. So this is a nice feature of aerobic respiration. And secondly, we can also process proteins, but your body will tend not to do this. The body does not want to oxidize proteins, generally speaking. It will only do that as a last resort. So this is where proteins will be used if there was no glucose, no or lack of fats available. So this is in more extreme conditions, like very, very ultra marathon running, where your body will literally start consuming its own muscle and break it down aerobically. Uh, I don't like talking about this one, but people in a very serious health condition of having... Um, being very very thin and having very few fat reserves maybe because of an eating disorder something like that or starvation um, people can start processing proteins this way but anyway that's not really a, a sports impact I just thought it was kind of interesting for you to be aware of the, bo the body will actually start, con start consuming its own organs uh, for energy in a desperation case anyway horrible stuff we don't really want to get into that okay let's talk about recovery and we'll come obviously we'll come back to uh, oh, I'll tell you what, just, uh, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm just going to pause there for a second. So before we actually get on to uh, recovery, I just want to just want to dip in to here. We've actually got the questions, uh, nice, simple, actually, the first one on the aerobic system. Identify the three stages. Of course, what we've got here is glycolysis, Krebs cycle, and electron transport chain. So it's a nice, simple question, but notice it's got a tariff to it. It's got three marks. Now, we're actually going to come back to this 15 marker in a few moments' time because we're going to talk about uh, bicarbonate supplementation later on. But notice here that we're asked to analyze the role of the aerobic system throughout a 3,000-meter race. So it's not because it's limping off to the bicarbonate uh, supplement from exercise physiology, but I want us to make sure that we've got a decent understanding of this aerobic system. I hope you've got the, the model answer the mark scheme in front of you here. But we've got aerobic system involves glycolysis, Krebs cycle, electron transport chain. So we're getting our AO1 in. Glycolysis in the cytoplasm. Glucose is converted into pyruvate. So we're almost going through a, a step by step into pyruvate in the, in the presence of sufficient notice term oxygen. Pyruvate is converted into citric acid carried to the Krebs cycle by acetyl coenzyme A. And this occurs in the mitochondria. That should be an O. Chondria. As, do the, as does the electron transport chain where hydrogen ions ions are oxidized. In total, 38 ATP are resynthesized net, and this energy is sustainable throughout the 3,000 meter race unless the athlete accelerates to a much higher intensity. The aerobic system is, so I'm now going into why it's ideal, the, the positives, ideal for the 3,000 meters because it powers long duration activities. It takes longer than three minutes, but is completed at moderate intensity. Okay, we're also saying apart from CO2 and water, there are no byproducts, and these two byproducts simply processed and breathed out. Furthermore, the system releases lots of energy, so it's efficient. The weakness of the system is it cannot power sprint finish because it's, it's, it can't do that. This is where anaerobic, anaerobic systems are necessary. I should have, I, I've missed a bit of marking in this little block here. That's that's worthy of credit, I think, in there. So, some nice points made. But the thing I want to really want to stress about this particular answer is I've literally gone through the process of answering this, then giving an evaluation. Okay, well, I've actually, I'm analyzing it, I'm breaking it down into its parts, obviously. But part of explaining that is saying what's good and bad about it, right? And I've done that within this answer. Now, I won't come, I won't do the, uh, the um, carbo, <laughs> carbo loading here, and uh, the bicarbonate supplementation. Oh, I just thought, I thought it was only bicarbonate supplement. Was it both? Oh, both glycogen loading and bicarb supplementation. We'll come back to that when we do that section at the end of this. Uh, at the end of this particular revision session. But that's a really nice uh, first part of our answer. So I tell you what, let's go straight back to the canvas and start and carry on with our epoch and our recovery. So there's a few things I'd like to do here, folks. First things first, I'd like to first, I'd, I'd like to get to the point where we understand why epoch is necessary. So when we start exercising, of course, we've got a sub-maximal exercise here. We notice that because it's a steady state performance. But what happens is at the start of exercise here, our body needs to be working at this intensity of oxygen consumption, but our system cannot get there quickly enough. We've just seen that because we've got the delay for oxygen delivery. We've got the delay potentially for glycogen delivery. So this area here is what we call oxygen deficit. I want to be crystal clear what this is. It's what we'd refer insufficient oxygen at the start of exercise, or it could be a change of intensity. Insufficient O2, that's what we're referring to, 
and we could also say it's a quantity of oxygen that would have been used if it was available. But because it wasn't available, how was that movement powered? Well, that additional energy was powered anaerobically. In other words, we were releasing lactic acid through that process through the glycolytic system. So that additional anaerobic work has now been done while the aerobic system catches up. Now, of course, we then have steady state, which means that oxygen supply equals oxygen demand. But at the end of exercise, or when exercise intensity drops, we must, in essence, recover this work, okay? And that is what EPOC is for. EPOC is a quantity of oxygen consumed after exercise, or it could be lowered intensity, above that which would have been consumed at rest, which would have, which would have been consumed at rest. So, in other words, our system does not drop down to resting levels I mean, go there. It has to oxidize this anaerobic work that has been done previously. It's really, really important that we realize that. So EPOC is to pay off oxygen deficit. Now let's take this a little bit further. Now, when I show you this next graph, or you've got it on your notes, of course, the only difference between that graph and this one is that we've moved the epoch this way. In other words, this is kind of superfluous to us in this next little thing. So we've just shifted everything left to get more space on the graph. So what do we have here? We now have the shape of uh, that epoch curve. So have a look. We now have a situation where oxygen deficit has occurred. There it is. There's oxygen deficit. It's occurred there. Of course, it didn't. It, that oxygen was not consumed because it's above the curve. And now what we've got is we've now got this, this decrease in uh, VO2 or oxygen consumption and we seem to have it in two stages. So let's see if we can go through this. Well, this first stage is what we would call, let's see if that's dark enough, no, let me change. This first stage is what we would call the fast component. And it's the fast component of EPOC, by the way. And I'm sure you guys know a bit about this already. We can also call this the A-lactacid component, the A-lactacid component. So this area A is the fast component of the A lactacid component. So we now need to start asking, well, what's going on in this process? What is this oxygen actually being used for? And we can be really, really explicit. I'm just going to go to the lighter color while I'm on the black. So what we're going to get here is we get the resynthesis, the resynthesis of PC. So PC is resynthesized during this period. Secondly, we also get resaturation of myoglobin. If you're not sure about myoglobin, it is effectively a store and a transport of oxygen within the sarcoplasm. Myoglobin. Okay, think of it like hemoglobin, but uh, inside the muscle cell itself. It's myoglobin, it's in there. It effectively transports oxygen to the mitochondria. But also, we get the resynthesis, resynthesis, of ATP. Now you might be thinking, okay, that's all good. We get up, we get our PC stored back. We get more ATP stored. My globe is resaturated. Now I want to start analysing this. How long does this take? First of all, well, first of all, this whole process will take 50% PC recovery in 30 seconds. Now start to apply that to your interval training, your plyometric training. If we can get half of our PC back in 30 seconds, but we can also get 100% PC in two to three mins, that gives us an indication of what our recovery period should be like. Furthermore, this whole area here, we know that this is gonna take between one to four liters of oxygen, not air, oxygen. So in order to complete this fast component, we need to get one between, obviously depending on how much work we've done, one to four liters of oxygen to the work muscles to get these processes done. Okay, now those processes need to happen, and that's how much it takes. Now, our second, and I'm going to do this sort of in a green color, our B area here, of course, is what we're going to call our slow component. No real surprise there, our slow component. We can call this our lactacid, lactacid component. Now, it seems to be suggesting that these two components are discrete, are separate from one another. This one ends there, and this one ends here. That's not really reliable. There is, of course, a blending of these processes. But what's happening in this slow component? We are, in essence, getting the removal of, and I'm sure you're gonna be shouting at me what it is, 
lactic acid. Okay, so we get this removal of lactic acid. Now, I'd just like to sort of spend a few moments saying, well, what happens to this? Like, in fact, before I do that, let me just give you a couple of other uh, processes. It can take, it's usually around about five minutes for this to happen. Okay, five minutes, but it can be up to 60 minutes. Okay, so this can take a little while, so it can take up to 60 minutes. And the other thing is that this is more oxygen than the fast component. We expect this to be five to six litres of oxygen for that process to actually be undertaken, okay? So we've got that slow component. Now, what I'd quickly like to do is look at the fate of lactate. Didn't mean to make that rhyme. Where does this lactate actually go? Remember, hydrogen ions need to be buffered and removed. What happens to this lactate? Well, first things first, some of it is processed for energy. In other words, we can reconvert it and we can break down lactate for energy. Some of it can be converted to pyruvate, of course, can then be taken down the aerobic pathway. Um, we also get some of it is converted to CO2 and water, which in which case it's breathed out. And we get a small amount which is converted to protein specifically urea, and I don't know, this is something you study at uh, GCC Biology, and that can be sweated out or weed out in, in our we, okay? So we've got, that, we've got that sort of fate of lactate. That's where that's actually going to. Now, to finish this little section off, let's go to here. Oh, there we go. I actually had my, my uh, questions further down the page there. <laughs> they're the ones that I went on to the... Um, they're the ones that I went on to the, uh, the actual exam and, and had a look at. So what we'll do there is we'll take a, we'll take a break and I'll be straight back with you uh, for specialist training. Oh, I just realised. I, well, let, yeah, let me, do, let me do this now. We, uh, Martha's back with me and she just pointed out to me that we had a really lovely tweet here from Chris Turner and the guys at Worthing College. I've been down to Worthing College. Really, um, really great place, actually. I just want to say thanks for posting that Martha just brought yeah, to my attention amazing, so yeah. it's, it's a really it's a really lovely one but anyway let me I meant to come back onto the camera first and then show that but I got the thing all lined up incorrectly whoops um anyway there we go uh Martha any questions or things you want me to answer before we delve into the second half uh no question in terms of the what you've explained one question from a student asking if you if students can watch this on demand after the session and mm -hmm. the answer is yes yep. all the sessions are recorded and they will be available on youtube and on the hub page as a recording after the session that's exactly right so um yeah i mean well put the second this finishes this afternoon um um it becomes a recording on YouTube, and the same the same link works on the hub page as well. So you, you you're very welcome to take this afterwards. And also, no, we're going quite we're kind of, we're going kind of quickly through quite a lot of content, and you probably want to actually readdress a couple of those points that we've kind of sped through. We're using a lot of imagery here, where normally we'd sort of build it by hand if we had more time and those sorts of things. So there are certain assumptions being made within the session. So make sure that you revisit anything that you're unsure about, especially looking at the nature of those model answers and where marks have been picked up on, uh, up on mark schemes as well. And I did want to stress something. I mean, I picked it up on Chris Turner's uh, tweet, actually, is that we are doing seven hours of AQA uh, A-level revision, or seven sessions, I should, should say. And it's, it's uh, you know, we're going to spend a lot. Martin, I'm not sure you and I spend seven hours together in a week. <laughs> so um, it's going to be, it's going to be emotional. Yeah. Anyway, anything further before we get back onto the, before before we get back onto the second half. No, that's all for me. Okay, so we're, we're making good progress here, folks. I'm going to give a, a very much estimated or projected finish time. I would be estimating, what are we now? We're uh, 6.21. I would be estimating we'll be finishing round about quarter to seven, there or thereabouts. Okay, so quarter to seven? Yeah, that's right, quarter to seven, there or thereabouts, just to give you a bit of guidance. But do get your questions into us. We really value it when you ask us things, folks. It kind of reassures us too. Brilliant numbers here tonight, by the way. We're really, really happy with that. And seeing, again, Chris's uh, tweet there, you know, we've got 200 odd people watching on YouTube, whatever and some of them are rooms full of 20 odd people so it's great anyway part two uh what we're doing specialist training let's see if we can make this work let's switch back so we're in good shape let's keep this going we're looking at the impact of specialist training and specifically altitude now before we kind of get into this i just want to give you sort of the evaluation that is i just want to give you some general descriptors we must be at or above 2500 meters that's around about 8,000 feet of altitude above sea level, we should be able to realize that the PO2, the, uh, the partial pressure of oxygen, is lower in the air at uh, altitude. 
Therefore, we get Hb, that's hemoglobin, not fully saturated with oxygen. Okay, so effectively, when we get to altitude, uh, Hb oxyhemoglobin will not. We, we won't combine uh, oxygen and hemoglobin to fully saturate oxyhemoglobin. Therefore, we get lower down arrow O2 carrying capacity. So, of course, these are negatives, but it's this stuff which is going to force the body to adapt, of course, in a few moments' time. Um, we also, therefore, we get an increased production EPO or thripoetin. Uh, that is effectively the hormone that stimulates uh, the stem cells of the bone marrow to start producing more red blood cells. And um, that's ultimately what we want to, to, take, to take place, which is going to force these adaptations. Now, what's positive about this? We get more red blood cells, as we said. We grow more capillaries around the alveoli, around the muscle tissue. Our oxygen carry capacity responds because we've got a greater hematocrit or red blood cell count. And uh, therefore, we can ultimately, after four, by the way, I should say it's often four to five weeks we would be at altitude. After four to five weeks, we're able to um, uh, carry more oxygen. This delays obli, we talked about earlier on, and therefore it, it increases our lactate tolerance. We work aerobically at higher intensities for longer, so when we come back down to sea level, we can actually, let's say, run at a higher pace without getting towards our lactate threshold and obla, and therefore we can also recover faster because, of course, recovery is aerobic. But, of course, there are negatives. At altitude, it's difficult to train. This stuff makes it hard. This is a negative, okay? We can't even um, sort of detrain when we're up there, suffer reversibility. We might experience hypoxia. Let me put that term in for you hypoxia is altitude sickness the benefits are lost quickly or we could simply say it's temporary now this is also why people will come down from altitude one to two days before their event the body can only produce a limited amount of epo so okay so this is the limit so no matter how much we do we can't go into mega overdrive of epo delivery and finally we've got away from home that sort of feeling of homesick it's also inconvenient it's also expensive it's also uh, impractical you could all use all these terms but that's a specialist training method and the impact of course on the energy system is we get the improved aerobic efficiency effectively we say increased aerobic power that's really what this summarizes to be perfectly honest with you now let's take this a little bit further before we change canvases we're looking at hit now with hit training what we're looking at here I just want to go through the process with you it's alternate it's alternate periods, so we could call this intermittent, by the way, another way of using this term. It's alternate periods, and it's really important to make this point. We get short, intense work, okay? So we do a short interval work, and we get a short, intense recovery. And I really want to stress this point, folks. It's not like we do the work really hard in the, in the, in the work period and then we kind of go, ah, oh, I can recover now in the long restful recovery period. No, the recovery is short and intense and you're back on it quickly. Now, this is really important because it's this that forces the aerobic systems to develop through here because, of course, the aerobic bit is the recovery bit. So just to be clear, just to be clear on this, the work is anaerobic, if I spelled it right, and the recovery... Is aerobic so if we uh, if we have very specific recovery times that forces our aerobic system to have to work really really hard so we work on both anaerobic and aerobic power and we have four variables in our uh, HIT training so what are those four variables well the first one is what we call duration of work okay so we can make the works longer or shorter Secondly, you know probably what's going to come here, you've got the duration of recovery. Duration recovery, you know how long that's going to be. Thirdly, you've got intensity, you know if you're doing running based stuff, you know what speed are you going, what percentage of maximum heart rate you can do. Um, and then of course, you've got your reps and sets. That you can manipulate those are the things that we can change around here now what is good about this system well first of all it can mimic the demands of sport what we mean by that is it's lots of changes of intensity which is really useful it's both aerobic and anaerobic energy which is really helpful we can build skills into it as well which means it's really applicable in sort of like a, a, an in-season training environment and it can be done individually as part of the team so it's really really practical however there are negatives um Injury might ensue because we're, we're powering it, okay? So it's it's a very intense exercise. Um, can't really bring in tactics. I don't know why that's a 
criticism of fitness, but anyway, um, it's aerobic and power can be developed using other types. So we don't have to use HIT to develop aerobic. We don't have to use HIT to develop anaerobic. We've got resistance training for anaerobic. We've got fart leg for aerobic. We could use those too, right? High intensity can negatively affect skill performance, negative transfer due to fatigue. So if we're building in our skills and we're pushing really hard in a HIT session, our skill might be actually influenced. Just a couple of other points that I would make as positives. It's limited equipment. So it's relatively straightforward. And just one other, um, it's simple spaces. And what I mean by this is if you're a football team, you can do it on a football pitch. If you're a if you're a volleyball club, you can do it on the volleyball court, you know, so it's kind of practical in that sense. Okay, I need to change the canvas here and I'll be back to you immediately. Let's see if we can power through here. Plyometrics is all, oh, hang on, let me change my layer. Plyometrics is also high intensity. I mean, it goes without saying, this is anaerobic work. Yes, the recovery a bit like HIIT could well be aerobic. This is high intensity work. We tend to find that this is involving activities like bounding, depth jumps, drop boxes, medicine balls, depth jumps, uh, hurdling, this sort of thing. That's what we're talking about. We're using fast twitch muscles. Obviously, we can study that in more detail, our three fiber types, but I'll just refer to the term fast twitch. It's used for power or a power slash explosive strength. That's what this system actually does, and it's why we go about using it. So these are descriptors that we can get into our answer. Now, it's got a principle, plyometric has a pin principle to it, and that is that a muscle, let's say this quadricep muscle here, it can increase force if before the contraction it's going to do, it is stretched. So we stretch, contract. Now, the best way to sort of summarize that is the way we do it is we do it, let me change color. We do an eccentric contraction first, which is effectively a stretch. And then we do a concentric, contra concentric contraction. Okay, concentric contraction. And that concentric contraction, it should be more powerful. Why? Because the stretching eccentric contraction happens first. So this person might, for example, drop off this box. They've got a brace and break the landing with their quadricep, that's called the rectus femoris, and then they're gonna spring off as quickly as possible. And of course, the landing is eccentric for the quadricep, the takeoff is concentric for the quadricep. We stretch and then contract. What happens? We get a greater power output. We actually call this the elastic recoil. The elastic recoil. And it's effective in situations that are plyometric in essence, okay? so. A couple of things we really want to um, we really want to make sure that we've got our phases. Okay, so we've got three phases to this. So let me put these phases in here, and I want you to be really explicit with these phases. So phase one, folks, is the eccentric phase. Okay, so we use the muscle that we're working. We're effectively going to contract it, lengthen it under tension. So lengthening under tension. This is often a landing of some kind or a catching of a medicine ball. The second phase of this. Second, it's a great word, this one. It's what we call amortization. Amortization. Let me be clear what this phase is and why this works. Okay, amortization. This is where the stored energy actually gets used. So the short, it, 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 there's in essence, what we're looking for is as short a time on the ground as possible. So we, so we drop, the muscle is lengthened, that increases the store of energy. And of course, the third phase, the third phase, is then what we'd call the contraction phase. I'll call it the muscle contraction phase. Now that, in es essence, is what we are talking about plyometrics. We do a lengthening or a contraction. We have as little as possible between the contractions. Then we do our concentric contraction with a greater elastic recall force. And of course, that increases the, the output that we have. Now, there's a couple of negatives in here. Uh, let me do it in this color here. We've got a higher risk of injury. Why? Because this is very intense. So obviously we're not going to do this with just anybody. We're going to do this with athletes. The other thing I just want to say as a general point is we'll tend to find that the rep range will be 12 to 15 reps and we'll tend to get a mark for saying that, okay? So 12 to 15 reps is the rep range for this kind of activity. Let's move it on. Obviously we're going to come back and answer some stuff on that, but I want to talk about speed, agility and quickness training. So nice and simple what SAQ um, stands for. The key points are as follows here, folks. In essence, we improve 
are multi-directional movement, which is why it includes lots of change of direction. So we do SAQ because we have to be agile in our performance. That's what we want. It's all about agility. Well, it's obvious it's in the name, isn't it? Speed, agility, and quickness. But this multi-directional movement, of course, leans towards that agility. Now, we also get an improved neuromuscular structure. Now, you might want to think about what we mean by that. And going back to that section of our learning, that means that the coordination between antagonistic pairs, in this case, when changing direction, improves. We would expect this to be things like zigzag runs. We'd expect this to be things like ladders, of which there are countless variations, by the way. We also have max force. So this kind of plyometric in its nature, really, it's max force, high speed. That's what we're talking about with SAQs. <clears throat> and finally, of course, this is anaerobic in nature. The recovery, of course, as for any other system, any other method, would be aerobic in the recovery. So that SAQ training, very possible that's going to be asked of you in your exam. Now, we're just going to go back to some questions here. The Denver Nuggets often have a large home court advantage um, due to the opponents having acclimatized to altitude or not acclimatized to altitude. Describe the short-term effects. Now, notice the term short-term. We've got to say what happens when they get there. Lower partial pressure of oxygen, Hemoglobin saturation falls, less oxygen to the working muscle. We have to increase breathing rate and tidal volume to maintain diffusion grade. In other words, we have to work harder for the same output that we would get at sea level. Now, we've also got here discussed the use of ply plyometrics for high jump athletes. We've got here, and of course, plyometrics is got, we're probably going to go to the positive and the negative. It's good for type 2B or type X fibers, 2X fibers. Um, it's eccentric followed by concentric. Obviously, we could look at the three phases there as well. The athlete can focus on the legs specifically for the high jumper because they could do leg work primarily. The actions replicate the bounding movements of the high jump, so that's a, a, a great link. Um, they also develop stability and balance. That's a really interesting point. Let's actually add that back into our notes. So here, we also get up arrow stability um, in our performance and balance. So that's a really nice additional peripheral aspect of our plyometrics training. Um, furthermore, oh, we should now go to the negative. However, plyometrics is not effective at develop, developing flexibility, which of course is critical to the high jumper. And the tendency to cause injury is higher because it's impacting. So we can actually call that contraindicating. So contraindicating, in other words, sometimes with some athletes, plyometrics could do more harm than good. Of course, we're talking about people coming back from an injury, maybe the elderly, maybe the very, the very young. Now, we've got a question here. A hit, um, describe three methods of altering a hit session. So hit can be adapted by lengthening or shortening the work period, increasing or decreasing the intensity. The rest interval can also be shortened. The recovery can be made active. That's actually really a really nice point there. Active recovery changes the nature of a session. That would be anything from HIT to plyometrics to circuits to anything. Um, and we've also got here the entire session can be made longer, so the whole duration of the session. Now, we're finishing off. I'm really only going to flash this at you. Uh, I published this image some time ago, and I really want to make some clarification points and then move on to the extended writing answer. Can I just stress that each time that I'm talking about, let's say, creatine, please notice that this little cross means a positive. This a positive, this is a positive. Whereas this little negative is that, a negative, a negative. What we've got here, folks, what we've got there is an evaluation. It might be asked of you as a discussion, but that is an evaluation. I'm evaluating the use of creatine. Uh, same with our sodium bicarbonate. I'll allow you to spend your time going through this and looking at why it might be good or bad. I don't think you really need me to read the list out for you, uh, but it's there. We've got um, caffeine as a stimulant. We've got the uh, we've got the evaluation there. We've got glycogen loading. The key thing I would say about glycogen loading is you've both got to be able to describe it and then evaluate it. Now that is no dissim not dissimilar to any of the other supplements, but the point I want to make here is that the glycogen loading process is a little bit more detailed and therefore you might want to spend a little bit of time on that. Now to finish off everything for today, I want to come back to the second half of our 20 marker, the benefits of glycogen loading and bicarbonate supplementation for a 3000 meter runner. And I have to say, snapping this picture made me laugh. First of all, Steph, who I must give a shout out to here, Steph Twell, 
ex-student of mine. Uh, we've been at athletics club together on numerous occasions. I often see her down the gym. The other day I was in a spin class with Steph. She's a two-time uh, Team GB Olympian, uh, brilliant person. I, I love bumping into her. Anyway, I tried to use it, but I didn't mean to get my Pinterest thing in there, which is what made me laugh. Anyway, we, we looked at this answer earlier on, and the point I want to make here is that the first part of my answer is all about that aerobic system. I then chunk this to talk about the second part of the answer, which of course here is glycogen loading and bicarbonate supplementation. So straight in, notice no introduction. Carbo loading is a seven day process from above. Starts with full glycogen depletion, this should have picked up, before carbohydrates are reintroduced to the diet in the three days before performance. This causes an increase in the glycogen store and means the runner can run at higher, so impact the runner can run at higher intensities aerobically without depleting. Therefore, the runner is not likely to hit the wall. I could have said there, well, I did. It's about depleting glycogen. On the downside, and now I'm giving... I mean, it's arguably whether you should give a downside here because it's asked you the benefits specifically. But if in doubt, put it in. So I've got on the downside, we've got um, cover loading, is it can be bloating and heavy feeling on the day of the race. So you see, I didn't get any credit for this. Why? Because I was asked about benefits. Now, I still would argue that put your evaluative points in. It shows you understand this topic. And then for our bicarbonate supplement, often taken with water, they help with the body's buffering uh, of lactic acid. By the way, just to be clear, buffering is removal of lactic acid during performance, okay? Not necessarily at the end or when we lower intensity, we can be removing lactic acid during performance, not just in that EPOC methodology we looked at before. Bicarbonate is released into the blood, which then mops up hydrogen ions released from lactic acid and converts them to carbonic acid before they're broken down into CO2 and water and breathed out. This helps to delay our blood, run at higher speeds without fatigue. Now, all of that information, folks, I just want to be clear here, all of that is in here, right? So all of those benefits, all of those benefits are in there. I also went through actually describing the processes describing the process and of course that's good practice for you to do in this case so i hope that's useful for you obviously we don't know whether that's going to be the question what we do know is that supplements have been named as a paper one topic so it's really pretty likely they're going to form part of a 15 mark uh, question obviously which is i've tried to envisage i suppose here well there we go Marta, I heard tinkling away in the background, so I think yes. there must be some questions. There are some questions. Mm -hmm. um, the first question, James, could you explain whether the advanced information for the topics of the summer exams are purely on 8 and 15 markers or mm. on shorter questions too? My, my belief is they're not purely on the 8 and 15 markers. I would be very confident the 8 and the 15 mark content has been included on the AEI. When I spoke to a colleague um, of mine, I'm not going to name because I don't have permission, but who is very tightly linked to AQA, it was, a, it was more of a suggestion that sort of uh, anything greater than three marks would have been included there. Now, I can't prove that to you folks. It's just an assumption by us. Uh, maybe it is just the 8 and the 15 stuff, but nevertheless, um, it, it's it's certainly worthwhile you learning all of the material. I don't know if that is or not what you want to hear, but that is what you need to do. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Also, there is a student who is in a bit of a panic. They okay. seem to think that they haven't been taught about Ovala. Okay. What are the main things they should know about it? Okay, so uh, let me just share exactly the requirement. Just bear with me. And I, I don't know your name, student, but I'll help you out with some resources for this as well. So if you just have a look here, uh, on the AEI here, let me just get onto this. On the AEI, what we've got, obviously, is we're looking at Obla in terms of this bullet point here. And let me show you on the specification. Okay, that is, where are we? That is this bullet point. Uh, that is this bullet point. Here. Oops, that is this bullet point here. And you'll notice that anaerobic glycolytic system, lactate accumulation, lactate threshold, Obla. So that's why we're including it. Um, now, what I will do, if it's agreeable to everyone else, is by the end of, um, by the end, or first thing tomorrow morning, possibly even tonight, I'll post a full teaching episode of Obler onto our YouTube channel. So where you are now, or if you're on YouTube, come back to there, and I'll post a full teaching episode of Vimeo for you, and you can get, like, everything, and I'll, I'll go to town with it, okay? So you'll have absolutely everything there for you, okay? I think that's probably the best thing 
that I can do if, you're, if your um, school is a user of our platform, the everlearn.com, all the teaching is already there. So if that's the case, you can simply go there and study it. It's, it's all there waiting for you. But I'll, I'll make sure you're resourced. So if you give us sort of 12, 12, 16 hours, I'll get on the YouTube channel, just check back into and I'll be there for you. Okay, brilliant. Thank right. you. Um, another question on advanced information content. Mm -hmm. What in this case? What is your advice on the non-advanced information Learn content? It. There's a student who's really quite worried. They yeah, don't I, feel they're going to have enough time. Yeah, I, I get it, and I'm sorry. I'm sorry you're worried. I do understand that. Um, you do need to learn it. Um, it is going to be examined. We don't know which bits, of course. They're not going to. The other stuff is not going to be in the higher tariff question. That's really good news. So I would certainly say try and look to the positive here. That you're in a good situation in the sense that okay, time is short, but you've got this real sort of advantage that you do know what the higher tariff uh, content is. Uh, likely to be uh, containing or is going to be containing so that gives you a big advantage so try and sit, see that as a positive I, I realize negative but the true answer to the other stuff because I would be completely wrong to say anything other than this is yes you do need to learn the other stuff why because there's going to be questions on it so uh, anything any answer I give you which is not no don't worry about it would be absolutely wrong so I can't give that answer I'm sorry what I can say is our platform teaches everything uh, and also quizzes and questions on everything. So if you want to get there, feel free. And I mentioned that free trial again, it's available. Any other questions, Great. Marta? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, another student is saying, for, for the specialist training, does it only include altitude, head plyometrics, and SAQ training? Yes. Uh, let me just go back to the spec. Just bear with me if I share that again. So if we just now scroll, scroll down to here, that's that section there. Okay, so we've got impact of specialist training on energy, altitude, hit, plyometrics, SAQ. So yes, is the is the base answer, is the simple answer to that question. Brilliant. Good. And uh, another student that is asking, when you refer to higher tariff questions, would that be questions over four marks? I th I'm I'm going to say I think I, this makes me nervous answering this firmly. I think, I think, quoting Darwin there, if you know the tree of life. Anyway, I think. Um, but I can't prove it to you and I could be wrong. That, it's interpretation, nothing more. Please, folks, please be prepared to, to answer the stuff. Um, what might be useful for you? Have, you? have you folks actually seen our infographics? If you haven't, we can. these are all available to you. I'm just going to put them on the screen for you and just show you the... Um, the AQA A level one. Just bear with me. If you haven't if you haven't got these, I would strongly, strongly endorse you having a look. So if you if you have a look, let me just share this again. Uh, just bear with me a second, folks. Here we go. So if you have a look on the infographics here, this is specifically for paper one. What we are arguing here, and if you look down here, this is where your marks are going to average from. So one markers, you're going to get eight to nine one markers. Two markers, you're going to get some like four. Um, total marks from two markers, three markers and four markers, uh, a reasonably substantial sort of double figures of marks, so two, three of these each, but of course then you've got your eight and your 15 which come in uh, significantly as well, with there being three of each. So um, yes, you, it's worth having a look at that, and there are obviously numerous lower tariff, lower tariff questions on there, but your eight and your 15 folks are your gateway to success on this paper. And I would even go further to say that analyzing and the analyzed skill is the gateway to success on this paper because it is by far the biggest contributor of marks. So if you can become good at that and understanding this sort of concept of breaking things into part and explaining them, then that's gonna be a massive advantage for you. And it's why we put those infographics out. If you haven't got those infographics, I cannot urge you enough to go and download them. They are utterly free. They are there for you and they're really insightful about what you're about to come up against against face. So I'd really recommend that folks because it gives you the inside track, okay? And there's a question, I hope it makes sense to you, is how are the three phases beneficial to getting physical improvements? Three phases of what, sorry? I don't know. <laughs> uh, plyometrics? Possibly. Um, plyometrics, yes. Yeah, okay, so, so... That was in the previous... Okay, so the key to that is that because we undertake that eccentric contraction, it forces that amortization, which is effectively, that the, because of the elastic nature of muscle fibers, remember your biology studies, contractile proteins, we can name them actin and myosin, it doesn't matter for here. But what they do is as they stretch, they effectively become more energetic. So when they recoil, that recoil is with more force. So of course, if you put more force through a muscle, it's more likely to adapt to that training 
influence with a greater adaptation. Let's say that we get a greater cross-sectional area of the muscle, for example. We have a greater proportion of type 2 B type 2 X fibers. So we get more adaptation because the muscle is actually contracting concentrically with more force. Why? Because just before that, it's been stretched and it goes back that way. That was a terrible demonstration, but you get my point. That's why those three phases are effective because we get that elastic recall effect into the concentric contraction because we're training with more force in our contractions we therefore get more adaptations it's as if with pnf stretching for example you can stretch the muscle further in flexibility training so therefore it causes you to be more flexible it's the same sort of principle mm -hmm. brilliant we've got one more question mm -hmm. do students need to know about all the supplements um yes yes you do uh, and i would go further because I mean, again, I can't prove it to you and I don't know it for sure, but because that paper two topic has been listed in the paper one, I'll just show you that, right? Just in case you're not sure what I'm referring to. Um, let me just get back to the right tab. I think it was this one. So if you, if you look here, uh, where are we? This topic here, and when we do skill acquisition next week, this topic here, these are both paper two topics that have been listed under paper one on the advanced information. Now, what that means in my book is that that topic is, it, topic is extremely likely to be incorporated into a synoptic question. Now I don't know what they're going to combine it with. It, it, could, it might not even be, uh, it might not even be something from the anatomy and physiology course. Remember that AQA they can do synoptic questions from any combination of disciplines within the course. They tend not to. They haven't yet. So I'm assuming it's going to be something from A and P energy training, and it's going to be something from, and it's going to be those supplements. But the answer to that is yes, you do need to learn all of those supplements and that's why I made that table I know it's boring I know it's dull I know it's not proper teaching but the truth is folks if you go away and learn that table and go and write that down in your answers you're going to smash the life out of those questions so I know what I would do I would learn it have we got time for a couple more questions yeah it's, it's, for me it's fine I yeah. mean yeah absolutely I know the students asking is there any chance paper to content will come up on paper one yes and I would say those areas that have been named are the targets. So just to be clear, I'll just put it on the screen one more time. Just to be clear, uh, that is going to be these two areas here. Okay. Now be reassured, we've gone over all of that in this session today. And we are going over that, including, let me get this right, a 15 marker combining with learning plateau on when are we doing skill acquisitions on Monday. So we're doing that on Monday. So you can see why I chose that question. Do you see now why I chose that question? Which was in essence, it was energy systems and it was supplements, right? And on Monday, we're gonna do learning plateau as a 15 marker combined with goal setting. So that's effectively why we're choosing to do it that way. So yes, paper two topics on paper one. That was the way around. They didn't ask me about paper one topics on paper two, did they? Um, no, I believe it that was paper around. two and paper one. There's no evidence to suggest that paper one topics will be on paper two that I can see. That doesn't mean they won't be. It's just not, it's not, it's not explicitly written in the AEI. Okay. Cool. So far, that's it. Well, look, I had a great time. I don't know about everyone else, and we had brilliant stats tonight as well. And a couple of things make me happy when we do these sessions. First of all, it's the average watch duration that people have. We really appreciate that. The second one is that we get consistent stats across what is effectively an hour, an hour and five minutes, and that's really good. But also the fact that you folks engage and ask questions, honestly, we really, really appreciate that. And I don't know if it shows, but I'm sort of in my element ask, answering these sort of questions, so I really... Really appreciate you asking uh, asking them of me, okay? Oh, I think you might have one more just come in, Marta. Ooh, hang on. <laughs> Everyone thought uh, they were going home. <laughs> you can't go home. Don't worry, you're allowed. No, well, there was Wax one... on a bit. It, it was one that I... So a student was asking, what's this, what uh, you think, what supplement will come up in the paper? I, re I, I, I honestly don't I sort know. of replied already on the, on I... the chat <clears throat> saying, we can't really predict what's going the to be The only thing paper. I would say is there's more content in the glycogen loading than there is, say, in the creatine. So if I was the exam writer and I was saying, right, I want a nice meaty 15 marker, I'd probably lean towards glycogen loading because it's got more to it. But that doesn't mean anything, folks. Doesn't mean, it, I mean, that's nothing. How can I ask this question? With the deepest respect to all you youngsters, why would you enter that room with the resource now that you've got in front of you, not deeply understanding that material? Go learn it. Believe in yourself. Put the time into it. You're worth it. Like when I when I work in schools, guys, I do a lot of... Obviously, I'm not in the room with you. I can't sort of build that rapport with you directly. But 
like when I speak to students a lot of the time, whether they've maybe been reluctant to learn or not committed or not been really driven, I always approach it the same way. Why, why don't you sort of value yourself enough to do this right? Why don't you, and I don't know how to get that across in like a, like a live show on YouTube type setting, but it's something worth reflecting on. Right? Don't do it because your teacher asked you. Don't do it because I'm suggesting. Don't do it because you're, your mum, your dad, your guardian is saying you've got to go study, whatever. Do it for you. Okay, Do it for you. And that's the reason to get that drive, in my opinion. Be deeply selfish in this situation. You're allowed to be around exams. Be deeply selfish. I'm putting time into this because it's me. And it's good for me. And it's good for my future. And therefore, I'm going to commit to it. Anyway, I'll get off my pep talk and get off my, <laughs> get off my soapbox. I hope that came. I hope that didn't come across as too inappropriate it's i mean it i mean it from the best 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 place <laughs> okay cool let's get the music on yeah. cheers folks have a cracker it's time for uh time for rest take care <laughs>